I've done a realistic rebuild for the entire Premier League. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another realistic rebuild on the channel. However, today there's a little bit of a twist because the Premier League season is kicking off again in just a few days by the time this video comes out. The brand new season, the 2022-23 season is about to begin. I'm sort of running out of time to bring you those realistic rebuilds. I did videos on Arsenal, Spurs, Newcastle, Manchester United, Chelsea. But I kind of want to talk about the other Premier League teams as well. So what's my solution? The solution was to do all of them in one big video. And that is what we're going to do today. I'm going to go from every team in the Premier League, from Arsenal all the way up until Wolves. And I'm going to go through the transfer business that I think is likely to happen, as well as the business that's already been done. But I'm also going to go through some of the tactical approaches, the way that the teams might set up for this coming season, as well as doing one big simulation at the end to see what does FM22 think is going to happen in the brand new Premier League season. This should be an exciting video. I hope you guys like it. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you've not done so already, please subscribe to the channel because we're heading towards 25,000 subscribers at the moment. That's the next aim. That's the next little target. It would really help me out if you help me to reach that target. Also, leave a like on the video if you do enjoy it too. Let's get into it by starting with Arsenal. So let's go in alphabetical order and we'll start with Arsenal. And I'll use them to sort of explain how the rest of today's video is actually going to work. For each Premier League team, I've set them up in their tactical approach, their tactic that I think they might use for this upcoming season. For Arsenal, it's this 4-3-3 that Arteta seems to enjoy playing in. He might actually make it a 4-2-3-1 when Erdegaard pushes forward the new club captain, Martin Erdegaard, by the way. But for each club, I've not only set them up in their tactical approach, but I've also gone and completed all of their transfers. Transfers too. I've gone and signed all the players that they've actually signed in real life. So for Arsenal, we've got Jesus, Sinchenko, Fabio Vieira. They've also got here Nuno Tavares, but ignore that one. That was a mistake. I accidentally, I, I tried to loan him out to Marseille, as I think is going to happen, but accidentally. I sent him on a permanence. I had to bring him back and then now he's gone on late. Ignore Tavares in this particular. But moving on from Nuno Tavares, I've also included any transfers that I think are realistic and could definitely help out each Premier League club. So for Arsenal, I think they should go and move for Yuri Tielemans. I talked about it in the Arteta realistic rebuild that we did do, which is a little bit more in-depth. In fact, there is going to be a link in the card above me here. If you are an Arsenal fan and you want to go and watch that, there's a little bit more detail. We did it a few weeks ago. But this then is how I think Arsenal will set up for this upcoming season. Ramsdale in gold, Tomiyasu White, Gabriel and Tierney at left back. Of course, they have also signed Zinchenko, who can come in and cover at left back or into the midfield. They've then got Party Tielemans, who will be a really good addition in this midfield, especially if he can capture some of his early Leicester form rather than his last season's Leicester form. And then Erdegaard to this right-hand side, the more attacking of the three midfielders. Saka from the right, Martinelli from the left, Jesus up front, who is definitely going to score Premier League goals for Arsenal, isn't he? He's been electric in pre-season. I'm quite excited to see how he gets on. They've also brought in Fabio Vieira who can play from wide, can play in this midfield position here if they want him to. And they've got great depth on the bench now as well with Smith Rowe. They've got Saliba back from his loans as well. I think Arteta's built a squad here that has strength in depth and can push towards those top four positions, which has to be the aim, especially after how last season ended. They have to see if they can get one of those top four spots this season. That's how today's video is going to work. Let's move through then from Arsenal to the next team, which is Aston Villa. At Villa, it's also a 4-3-3, in my opinion, that Steven Gerrard will go with next season. It includes some players that have happened and signed in real life, such as Bubakar Kamara on a free transfer, Diego Carlos in at centre-back too, as well as some suggestions from me, some players that I'm putting forward as players that I think would be useful for Aston Villa. A striker being one of those, Raul de Tomas, who has scored goals in Spain. He comes from Espanyol, would cost around £20 million, maybe there or thereabouts. And I just wonder, do they need another striker? in their squad. Is Danny Ings happy? Does he want to leave the club? There are still reports going around that he does. Is Ollie Watkins reliable enough in terms of his injury record to continue to lead that line? Do they need somebody else? In my opinion, they do. I think Raul de Thomas would be a good option for them there. With him as an addition, with the emergence of maybe Leon Bailey playing a few more games from last season, Coutinho, of course, is now here on a permanent transfer. You've got McGinn, who's been made the club captain now, stripped from Tyron Mings. You've got Jacob Ramsey, very, very exciting in this midfield. They've got a defence that has been bolstered by Diego Carlos. I think Matty Cash is fantastic. Dinia's great. Their goalkeeper is excellent in Emi Martinez. They're building a strong team here. They had a really good start to last season, then really fell off a cliff under Gerrard. I wonder now... 
whether they can push on. Maybe signing a striker in the final few weeks of the window is something that would really help them to make a good start to this Premier League season. That's Aston Villa. Let's move through to Bournemouth. Am I a little bit worried about Bournemouth's survival chances for the Premier League this season? Yes, I am. As I record this, the only confirmed transfer business that they've actually gone and done is to bring in Ryan Fredericks on a free transfer from West Ham and Joe Rothwell on a free from Blackburn. Is that inspiring business that is going to keep a team in the Premier League? I'm not sure it is. Maybe Scott Parker is going for that continuity, keeping the squad together that got him promoted, got them promoted from the championship in seconds. Is it enough? I'm not quite sure. I've put forward two players that I think they should go for to maybe solidify defensively. Two centre-backs in that. Phillips from Liverpool. I think £10 million would be enough to sign him on a permanent deal. And then Courtney House from Villa for about £5 million. I think with him falling down the pecking order after Diego Carlos comes in would be enough to sign him. Is this enough to keep Bournemouth in the Premier League? I'm not sure of it, but I kind of hope they do. I hope that, you know, not spending big and just splashing the cash, they can manage to survive, but I'm worried. For Brentford, it seems like we might be seeing a change of formation. If pre-season is anything to go by, I wonder if Thomas Frank is going to go for this more conventional 4-3-3 and move away from that 3 at the back or 5 at the back, 3-5-2 system that they did use for much of last season. I wonder if that's because he's now confident in the team that they've established themselves in the Premier League. Maybe he's confident in the signings that he's been able to make too. He has signed, and these are confirmed signings, of Keen Lewis Potter from Hull, a youngster with a lot of potential. Aaron Hickey seemed like most of Europe wanted him from Bologna. He's ended up going to Brentford. Thomas Strakosha, who is a well-established goalkeeper from Lazio to put a bit of pressure on David Rea. And then also Ben Mee, who I think is a really smart signing. A lot of Premier League experience from Ben Mee. Maybe, just maybe, that's given Thomas Frank the confidence to go for a 4-3-3. And I've put forward a couple of players that I think they should go and sign in. Mikhail Damsgaard from Sampdoria. They, of course, missed out on Christian Eriksen, who's gone to Manchester United. Why not go and get his Danish companion Patriot, Mikhail Damsgaard, highly rated, still only 21 years old. I think it'd be a really smart signing for Brentford. Something I could see happening as well. And then I've also put forward another youngster in Mario Vuskovic, who is a big, tall centre-back. Croatian. Seems very Brentford to me. That's why I've signed him for about £10 million from Hajduk Split. That's my realistic rebuild for Brentford. Let's move through now to Brighton. For Brighton, Graham Potter will be looking for more of the same, you'd think, except maybe with a little bit more bite up front, which is why some of the signings I'm going to suggest are at that end of the pitch, including Steffi Mavadidi, who is an English striker who has recently been playing in France, has scored goals for Montpellier, I think it's a very bright and signing and they are going to need a player up front, I do believe, especially if some of the other transfers that I'm going to put forward here actually end up going through. In terms of actual confirmed signings that they've made at this point, as I record this, they haven't made any at Brighton. The only confirmed transfers for them are the sales of Yves Basuma and Leo Ostergaard for about £30 million altogether. I've added to that the sales of Neil Mope, who is in talks with Salernitana as I record this. And also, I think it's still inevitable that Mark Cucurella does go to Manchester City. As I'm recording this, apparently they've ended talks and Brighton are holding out for £50 million. I just think if Manchester City want a player, they inevitably go and get him. I think Cucurella might end up still going to Man City. If Brighton can hold on to him though, that would be very, very positive news for them. I have also added, along with Steffi Mavadidi, Florian Grilich from he's not at West Ham. I had to move him from West Ham here. He was most recently at Hoffenheim where he'd been for a few seasons. His contract had expired there. A Combative midfielder, plenty of height. Very Pascal Gross, I feel. Florian Grilich. That's where I just think he makes a lot of sense if Brighton wants to go and bring him in. Those are the signings I would go and make. And I think Brighton will be looking for top half finish this season. Chelsea then, and some of their business, in my opinion, has been very impressive, particularly Raheem Sterling coming in, is going to be pivotal for their future success, in my opinion. He will play on this left-hand side, potentially, with Mount in behind Havertz as this deep-lying, false 90 type striker. Kovacic and Kante in the middle. James and Chilwell being back for most games or being available more often this season is going to be very important for them. But the main area where Chelsea have a little bit of an issue still is at centre-back. Thiago Silva is pretty old now. They've lost Christensen. They've lost Rudiger. They are going to need to make a signing. That's where I am putting forward the potential signing of Wesley Fofana. If they really mean business, Chelsea, which they seem to want to do with the potential signings of Koundé, who they missed out on, maybe Kimpembe, maybe Pavard I've seen linked. I think they should go for Wesley Fofana. Young at 21 years old. Go and build for the future. Go and bring in a player for a big amount of money. Yes, but new owner. Is he likely to do it? 
feel like he is quite likely to go and do it. This Chelsea team then just then might well mean business. Crystal Palace then, a young and exciting team under Patrick Vieira last season. Losing Conor Gallagher in that midfield this year is going to be a big loss for them. But, but if we go straight to the transfers here, they have made some signings already that are confirmed. Check Decore into that midfield. A ball winner in there for £20 million from RC Lons is a very exciting player. Another youngster at 22 years old. Chris Richards to another young defender, 22 years old. From Bayern, the American. Sam Johnston is going to be a backup goalkeeper. And I've added a couple of extra extra players that I think would suit the, the approach that Vieira is going for at Palace. One of those is Bamba Dieng, 22 years old. Seems a bit of a theme there, doesn't it? He's a pacey striker from Marseille, and I think for about £10 million, they could land him, adding to a strike force that has struggled, actually, for Palace. They've got Benteke, Mateta, Edward. None of them really have grabbed that spot in that Palace team. Can a different player in Bamba Dieng go and do that? And then in the midfield, Billy Gilmore on loan from Chelsea. They've seen how loans from Chelsea have been successful for them. Billy Gilmore is another player that probably is going to need to be loaned out from Chelsea this year. I'm thinking maybe a little move to Crystal Palace to go in there. Maybe ahead of Jeffrey Schlupp in that midfield could be a spot for him. I'm quite excited to see how this Palace team develops going into next season. I think they'll set up a little bit like this. Everton next, and they're a curious case, not only because of the sale of Richarlison, but because of the financial issues they had last season or continue to have. Maybe that Richarlison sale has offset that somewhat, but also because of where they finished last year, just narrowly avoiding that relegation. Fans will be demanding so much more than that, but maybe there's room for optimism here. Maybe, just maybe, some of these signings that they have made or are going to make are going to fill the fans with a little bit of optimism they have signed ignore the Rafa Suarez here they've signed James Tarkovsky I think this is smart business on a free from Burnley they've also signed Dwight McNeil I just wonder is he going to be a real success story I think he's a real decent player Dwight McNeil and I think that's smart business in itself they've also signed Ruben Vinagra from Sporting rather than just Wolves on here on loan which I think is smart they need a right back they need somebody to cover at left back as well I've added some extra ones too in Michi Batshuayi I just wonder you know the Chelsea link there will they go back and bring in another another option with Richarlison moving on they are going to need a striking option Ross Barkley I've added to this one I think is less like but again, the Chelsea link. Do they go and bring in Ross Barkley? And then Idrissa Gay is the final one. Now, I see this one actually happening because he's obviously not wanted at PSG and could be so useful in this Everton midfield, which I've set up in a sort of 5-2-3 here almost for Lampard, with Ducore and Gay being very industrious in this midfield too. Patterson playing a lot of games at right back, but Vinagra can play there too. Mikalenko also covered by Vinagra. Tarkovsky, Mina, Godfrey, McNeil from the right cutting in, Gordon from the left cutting in. We've seen how dangerous he is, and they're going to need a big season from Dominic Calvert-Lewin as well. Is there room for optimism for Everton? Can they move away from that relegation zone? That will be the order of the day for Frank Lampard. I think there are signs of recovery. Full of next, then I suppose the big story here for them is whether or not Alexander Mitrovic, their star striker from last season, breaking all records at championship level, whether or not he can cut it at that Premier League level where he sort of failed in the past. I think he's developed his game and changed the way he plays quite a lot that I think we're going to see a different Alexander Mitrovic this summer. At least I kind of hope so, or this season I should say. At least I kind of hope so. Anyway, I've set them up in a 4-2-3-1 here. Some new signings that are confirmed signings in there like Mbabu, like Palinia, like Andreas Pereira. All of those I think smart signings. Some other signings that I'm going to suggest are likely to happen or maybe are just ones that I think should happen in Burnt Leno in goal from Arsenal. I think he's a Premier League proven goalkeeper was pretty good until they replaced him and improved on him with Ramsdale. It's a Diop from West Ham, another Premier League level centre-back. I think would be a good option for them. And then I think with that business, you've got a squad here that has the possibility of staying up. It's going to take a lot. They've been here before Fulham where they've spent a lot of money and then ultimately not been good enough and gone back down. This time again, they're going to have a real go at it. Can they stay up? It remains to be seen.
Leeds now, and it's another club where it feels like there's a lot to be done in this summer window. And it seems like the club themselves have agreed with that sentiment based on how much business they've already gone and done. If we have a look at this 4231 in a second, but before that, have a look at some of the business that has been confirmed before I record this. If we go down this list, Luis Sinistera, an exciting winger or young 23 year old pacey player from uh, Feyenoord, 22 million pounds has been spent on him. Tyler Adams, the American, to go with the American manager, 18 million pounds from Leipzig. Christensen from Salzburg. Is Jesse Marsh here going for players that he knows well from his time at Salzburg and being American, etc. And then adding to that, some players, Mark Rocker, there's another one that has been confirmed. Giabi, the youngster too. And then I've added to that some players that I think would just add a little bit of quality, but also some squad depth, which they badly needed last season. Their squad was threadbare with the injuries. Patrick Bamford missing the whole season, for example. They've also lost some key players. Rafinha to Barcelona. Calvin Phillips has gone to Manchester City. Leeds will miss those players. They do need to reinvest that money, which they've already done. And I've added to those with a couple of extra players too. Philip Max is one of them. It seems like they're a little bit light at left back. I think he'd be a good option for them. They could get him for about £17 million. Pounds. I think they should go and do that. Also, if we move through Ishmael Asar, who I mentioned from Watford, they got relegated. He could be great for them. And then a youngster up front, Arno Calamuendo from PSG. Again, Patrick Bamford missed a lot of games. They had to play Dan James up front. It just wasn't really working. Rodrigo playing striker. They needed another player up front there too. Calamuendo is a player that I think has got a lot of potential. Maybe he could be the one. Maybe not. That's one that I'm kind of pushing forward here. Joe Geller, of course, himself. Played a few games. The youngster coming up with some important assists and chipping in where they needed him to to keep them in the Premier League last season. Leeds, they've got a lot to do here. They need to kick on with their new transfers in. I think they'll set up a little bit like this. Be interesting to see how they get on next season. Next up is Leicester, a team that have been very, very quiet in this summer window so far and actually have made no signings and also sold nobody. In this particular scenario, with the way that the transfers have gone with other teams, I've actually ended up selling two pretty important players. So really in real life, what I may be thinking for Leicester is the best business that they could do is holding on to their best players. As I mentioned in this particular scenario, I've ended up selling Yuri Tielemans to Arsenal and then Wesley Fofana to Chelsea. £90 million being brought in. Maybe that would see them jump into action in the transfer market. I've done three signings, as you can see. Levi Colwell is the first one. With Wesley Fofana going to Chelsea, I think that they'd be willing to let Levi Colwell go and I think Leicester should be all over that if that was the case. He's a very good, young, promising defender that I think will make it in the Premier League at some point. Leicester like to sign these young defenders. That's why they had Fofana. That's why they've developed him. Cole Will, I think, would be a really good move. Maybe like a bit of a make weight in that deal as well. £12 million. I think that'd be really good business. The next one is a player that I think all Premier League clubs should be all over. And actually, maybe if Leicester were to make this signing, this would be a really good bit of business. Ibrahim Sangari from PSV, six foot three centre midfielder. Him alongside Ndidi in there, maybe Dewsbury Hall alongside them too. Could actually be a pretty useful midfield three that alongside the final signing I've made, which is Matt O'Reilly. There are plenty of links in real life linking Matt O'Reilly to Leicester from Celtic. Again, another young, promising midfielder. Leicester do have that about them where they bring in the young players, make them Premier League quality and then sell them on for a lot of money in the future. I think they set up a little bit like this. You could maybe see Sangari or Ndidi dropping a little bit deeper into a more regular 4-3-3. But this, I think, would be making the best of a quite disappointing scenario for Leicester. I'm a little bit worried about their transfer business. Next up is Liverpool, and this one should be a short one because, quite frankly, I don't think they're going to do any more business than they've already done. I have done one extra little transfer just because we're doing a realistic rebuild. And do you know what? If there was a position that Liverpool were going to go and sign, I think they might go and sign a central midfielder. So Mateus Nunes would be my pick if they were to go and sign a midfielder. In real life, though, I think I'd actually prefer them to wait till next year and go and get Bellingham. But I brought Nunes in because he's a fantastic player and I think he'd be a really good acquisition if they were to go and bring him in. Instead, though, I think we're going to see Liverpool setting up in this 4-3-3 type system, maybe a little bit more 4-2-3-1 this season, where instead of being a Carrillero in this midfield, you've got like a Metzali. You might see a lot more of Harvey Elliott. You might see Naby Keita in here, Curtis Jones, where actually when you're in possession, Fabinho pushes into the midfield. Elliott pushes into this centre attacking midfield spot. It becomes a little bit more 4-2-3-1. But of course, Liverpool have also signed Nunes. They've signed Carvalho, who will also play in this spot too, as well as the youngster Calvin Ramsey at right back. I don't think Liverpool will do too much. I have 
haven't done anything else in terms of transfers except for what you've already seen. Uh, ignore the Antonio Rudiger thing there. That means nothing. Let's move on to the next team. And that next team is Manchester City. It's another team, another squad where I don't see that much more in terms of future business. I have done one extra transfer as a an addition to what has happened in real life so far. I've mentioned that already. That is Mark Cucurella, who I still think just about makes it to Manchester City this summer. Alongside Calvin Phillips, alongside, of course, Erling Haaland up top as well. The team, I mean, it's a scary, scary squad, isn't it? If you just look at that, look at some of the players that are on the bench here. Calvin Phillips and Cucurella. Corella, Grealish. I mean, there are plenty of players that can come in and influence this. This City team will be there or thereabouts in terms of the title at the end of the season. I wonder, I was just thinking out loud, how do Liverpool get closer to this City team? Is it the five substitutes, the change to the rule for this season? Maybe it's just that. The City team, though, losing Sterling, losing Jesus, losing Fernandinho, maybe that will have an impact. I don't know. Manchester City, they're going to be very, very good. Erling Haaland is going to score goals, isn't he? Let's move on to the next team, which is more interesting in terms of transfer. Transfers, Manchester United. Manchester United then the next team and the big one around Manchester United maybe the biggest transfer saga of this summer is around Frankie de Jong and I've just got a feeling I surely he's given some type of inkling towards Manchester United that he would be willing to actually go and join otherwise why are they putting so many resources into this this transfer chase surely it happens right right Manchester United fans let me know in the comments down below because I've just got a feeling that this one does actually end up happening you have to think so with the way that Barcelona owner are spending money but I suppose we'll find out about that one I've set up this Manchester United team in this 4-2-3-1 there are a few players that could be interchangeable here I'm well aware of that Luke Shaw for example maybe Malassia comes in and impresses and gets a starting place there Martial I think has been really good in pre-season could be a really big season for him I think maybe he'll come in and be this striker at different times maybe he'll play from the left hand side and we'll see Ronaldo back through the middle I do wonder about that I wonder about Maguire will he keep his starting place will we actually see Martinez come in instead of Varane in this particular position you don't buy Ericsson without the promise that he's going to play some football but is he a box-to-box -box midfielder I'm not quite sure how the chips will fall for Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United but in terms of transfer business the one thing that I do see happening before the window closes is Frankie Dion coming through the door that's about it really in terms of extra signings that I've gone and made I have also sold the players that also left but there's nothing there's nothing new in that there that is my realistic rebuild for Manchester United how it gets on where they finish I mean I don't know the next team is Newcastle and it's another team that I've done a full video on on how I would realistically rebuild them this summer. So if you want to watch that, the link is in the card above there. But in a short version of it, I've kind of tweaked it slightly in that I've seen a few opportunities for players that I think Newcastle may actually realistically go for. For example, Maxwell Cornet is still available from Burnley and for about £17.5 million, I think it is, that seems like a really good deal and it's a, po a position that Newcastle need to go and get a player in from one of these wings he can provide a little bit of support from this left hand side could also play left back which is a position where they lack a little bit of depth too so it, i just think it makes quite a lot of sense the other player that i've gone and suggested that newcastle go and sign is armando broher on loan from chelsea the way the transfer market has gone and the ripple effect of players like skamaka going to west ham has seen broher still be available on that loan and it just makes quite a lot of sense to me for him to go to Newcastle from Chelsea this summer I think he'd be a really good asset for them alongside Callum Wilson alongside Chris Wood as backups you can't really rely on either of those particularly over the course of a season in terms of either for goals or in terms of just being able to get on the pitch without injuries so I think it makes sense to bring in Broha there. I've done the rest of the business as has already been done in real life. Target, Cornet, Broha, Pope and Botman are the signings for Newcastle this summer. Pushing towards hopefully a top flight finish for them. I think they'd be happy with that. As I said in that longer video that I did earlier on. I think it was this month or the month before. Forest now and one of the most active clubs in the transfer market this summer. They have brought in a fair few players. If I have a look at the transfer history here, you can see just about all of these players have been brought in and confirmed in real life at this stage. I've added one extra signing to that myself, which is Oral Mangala. I do feel looking at the squad and how it would be set up, central midfield is maybe where they're still slightly lacking a footballer. An extra body in there, an extra Premier League quality player. Mangala coming in from Stuttgart, I think would absolutely be that. 
available for about 13 million pounds. I think he'd be a really good signing for them. That's why I have suggested him. But there's also some really smart business in here. Lingard, I think, managing to actually persuade him to come and join Nottingham Forest is a big, big achievement in itself. Hopefully they can get a tune out of him. I was looking to where we can get Brennan Johnson into this side. I wonder if he will start as a striker, at least for the first part of the season, whilst we bed in a few of these players. I think Nico Williams is a smart signing. I think Nia Carte is really good. At least he is on FM as well. A one year up front, big and strong, could be an asset for them if used correctly. I think some of their business has been smart. I think they've got a lot to do, though, if they're going to survive in this Premier League. One thing you can't say, though, is that they're not going for it. They have spent big and they're going to make a real fist of this Premier League season. Next up then is Spurs and I think quite rightly people are saying how impressive their transfer window has been this summer and I would tend to agree the players that they have managed to bring in players like Yves Basuma they're already adapted to the Premier League they're going to slot in there so seamlessly and improve them as a footballing team I think players like Richarlison could be a useful signing we talked about it in the longer form video that we did all about Spurs' transfer window again it's in the card up above if you are a Spurs fan and you want to go and check it out I think Richarlison could help them out in that regard coming in for any of this front three of Kane, Son and Kulisevsky and being really good in their absence. I've added one extra signing on top of what they've done in real life, which I've had an added here. Look, Basuma, Richarlison, Forster, Spence, Perisic, Longley on loan and then Romero on a permanent two. I've added one player. Maybe it's a little bit unrealistic, but I suppose if they were to go and bring in one more player... I'd be looking at Nicolo Zaniolo. He's a fantastic footballer. I think he could be such an asset for Spurs. If they were truly serious about going for this title, which I'm not sure how far away they are these days, Zaniolo would be right up there for me. He would be another dimension to this Spurs attack. A scary proposition. I'd go and try and bring him in. I don't know how realistic that is. I think it's a bit like the Liverpool situation where their business is probably done. But if I was to add one more, like I added Mateus Nunes to Liverpool, I would add Zaniolo to Spurs and just see how amazing he would be. That Spurs, we've got a couple of teams left before we go and simulate this season. The penultimate team is West Ham then. I've set them up in a 4-2-3-1, as you can see, with some of their signings which they've made and been confirmed in real life. And a couple of extra ones that I've added on top too. If we go through the team, Fabianski as the goalkeeper, I think it's going to be his last season. Well, it probably will be his last season. Will he even be able to start this season? I'm not sure. Maybe Ariola, who they've signed permanently, will now come in. I'm not quite sure. I feel like Fabianski might just stay in for now. So Falzuma, Aguerd, who they spent big money on at centre-back, is probably going to start there. He is left-footed too. I've brought in a new left-back. It was only really Creswell who was in that left-back position for them. So I've brought in Grimaldo from Benfica. £12 million. I think he'd be a really good option for them. So I've brought him in. Midfield two of Rice, Suchek, Lanzini in front of those. Bowen from the right, Fornells from the left. And then the big man up front, the new signing in, Gianluca Scamacca. Scored plenty of goals in Serie A last season. Will he be able to translate those goals to the Premier League? We will find out. Those are the transfers then. Only really Grimaldo on top of what was really done in real life for me. I've added him too, as well as selling Diop to Fulham and Grilich, which you just need to ignore. They signed him. The AI signed him. Now I've released him and sent him to Brighton. Our final Premier League team then to realistically rebuild in today's video is Wolves. Going alphabetically, they're always going to be the last one here. And as I record this, they're in a little bit of a striking crisis with an injury to Raul Jimenez. And after sending out Fabio Silva on loan, they've not really got a recognised first choice striker except for Huang Hee Chan, who they have signed permanently, but has failed to impress slightly. So the main bit of business that I've done to rebuild Wolves in this area is to bring in... Edin Dzeko. Yes, I know he's 36, turning 37 years old, but I could see him being really useful in this Premier League once again. And I think he'd suit the way that Wolves would set up, especially coming in for Raul Jimenez, especially in this 4-3-3, which Bruno Large seems to have gone for in pre-season this summer, moving away from his back three or back five system that he used before. He's got pacey wingers in Podence and Neto now that he's back from his injury. These two could swap over and be on either side as well. Neves and Moutinho looks decent, I think, in that midfield. Then Donker in front of the defence. New signing Nathan Collins in at centre-back along alongside Max Kilman. That's what they've done in their most recent friendlies. That does mean leaving out Connor Cody, the captain though. 
That would be a big call. I'm not sure we'll see it, but do you know what? They have played in most of the friendlies and look pretty good in them. So it would be a big call, but I would not be surprised to see Wolves line up like this. In terms of the transfers, just, just to sum it all up then, to finish things off, they have signed Nathan Collins, as has been done in real life. I've signed Edin Dzeko. I've put it on a free. It might well come with a little bit of a transfer fee as well. But at 36 years old, you'd imagine that it wouldn't take too much to prize him away from Inter. Vinagra has actually finished his loan. He went back to sporting before going to Everton. And Fabio Silva, we talked about, went on loan to Anderlecht. Keanu Hoover also went out on loan. There were one or two other departures too, but this, I think, is the way that I would rebuild Wolves. I think they'll be aiming for a top, top eight again, top seven, top eight, aiming for Europe, I think, would be pretty good for Wolves going into next season. And that concludes all of our realistic rebuilds. What we're going to go and do now, though, is we're going to go and simulate the entire season to see once all of these clubs have been rebuilt, how does FM predict they're going to do? in next season's Premier League. Let's go and do some simulations. Okay, before we do go and simulate that season, I did just think we'd take a peek at the season preview just to see whether any of these realistic rebuilds was going to make any differences to the preseason odds. And well, I'm not sure they really did too much. If we have a look though, there are a few interesting things here. Manchester City are the favourites, as you'd expect lots of their players in the media. Dream 11 as well. Sterling getting in there for Chelsea as well, which is a fun one. Salah and Kane up front. Fabinho as a right back, which is quite interesting Manchester City favorites then Liverpool then Chelsea Spurs favorites for fourth I think a lot of people would agree with that this season Manchester United in fifth then Arsenal then Newcastle if you look all the way down for relegation Forest are the favorites to be relegated then Bournemouth then Fulham Brentford to struggle Palace to struggle Leeds to finish 13th that is the Premier League season preview then should we see how close to this it ends up being let's then go to the end of the season let's go to may where we will share who wins the league who gets relegated the top scorer the best average rating all of that good stuff too i will see you in may okay so the simulation is done and while the results they're not exactly how you would have expected them to have gone let's have a look at this premier league table then as Chelsea are our Premier League champions for 2022-23. Obviously, the business that they've done, bringing in Sterling, bringing in Koulibaly, etc., etc., has done them enough to win the Premier League title by, literally by one point, to Liverpool in second, and also only one point, to Manchester City in third. It goes Chelsea, Liverpool, City, Manchester United, then Arsenal, then Spurs, and then Wolves. Perhaps the top six there were fairly predictable. Definitely not the order that they've ended up finishing in. But then maybe having Spurs down in six, is that a bit of a surprise? Wolves ahead of West Ham? Not sure that is a surprise, but maybe there or thereabouts for where you'd expect them to finish. Leicester down in 12th. Newcastle down in 14th after all of their investment. The teams that got relegated were Forest, 35 points, only just going down just below Everton, who also got 35 points. Brighton, relegated this season was that because of a lack of firepower up front potentially and then Bournemouth were bottom 22 points a really poor performance from then let's have a look at the player stats then in terms of goals we've got Mohamed Salah winning the golden boot just ahead of Kai Havertz Harry Kane and then Shea Adams, who got 20 league goals. Edward, who I didn't suggest was going to be a starter for Palace, got 18 goals. Ivan Tony, Calvert-Lewin. There's Erling Haaland. Maybe you'd expect him to get more than 17. There's Sterling on 15. Chelsea went and signed Dybala after we rebuilt them. So maybe that's why they've ended up winning the league there. They've added to the players that we added to the club as well. I scroll down to see Nunes got 10 goals. Let's go and check out who got the top average rating. It was again Mo Salah on 7.83. Then Bernardo Silva and Foden just below him. Assists. It was 13 assists for Bernardo Silva. 13. Same for Harry Kane and then 11 for James Ward-Prowse. Maybe predictably for them as well. Player of the match. It was Mohamed Salah who got the most player of the matches. Alisson got the most clean sheets. That that then is what FM predicts the Premier League table is going to look like. If some of the realistic transfers that we've done actually come to fruition, what do you think is going to happen in next season's Premier League table? How did you think I did on some of those transfers? Do you argue with any of them? Do you want to say I agree with any of them? Let me know in those comments down below. And if you enjoyed this bumper video today, it's going to be quite a long one, I think. If you've enjoyed it, please do leave a like on the video. If you've got this far, it does show that you must have enjoyed it, even just a little bit. And also, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel. There are going to be so many videos coming your way as I try and make the best use of my summer holidays to get as much content out to you guys as possible because you guys you deserve it thank you very much for watching i hope you have a lovely lovely rest of your day i'll see you very soon bye bye